our research funding organizations about how can RFOs fight gender bias. We have um, wonderful speakers that I will be uh, introducing them. Um, but first, let me um, let me just um, tell you what it is super about. Um, Paula, maybe you can uh, put the, the the next slide because Supera is a, an Horizon 2020 supported project uh, whose main objective is achieving uh, gender equality in research through institutional change. Um, our main activity is the design and implementation of gender equality plans, both in uh, the four universities that we have in our consortium and the two research funding organizations. By, Paula, if you change uh, for the next one. Uh, the, the consortium is coordinated by the uh, University Complutense of Madrid and uh, the others, uh, uh, in three implementing partners universities, uh, apart from the Complutense University in Madrid, is University of Coimbra, University of Cagliari uh, in, in Italy, and the Central uh, European uh, University in Budapest and Vienna now. Uh, the project is in, uh, in, in its third of uh, the four uh, year the, the, the dura duration. So, um, which are the uh, 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 slide the RFOs, uh, which uh, are in our consortium, are uh, the Spanish Ministry in Science and Innovation, and RAS, which is the uh, uh, authority, uh, regional uh, authority of Sardinia. Uh, and both of them um, are part of this, uh, of this consortium. And they are, of course, applying also. Uh, in one case, in the RAS case, we already have the gender equality plan uh, approved. And in the ministry, we are about to. And uh, both of them are uh, doing uh, that. In, and we have, as part of the consortium, this ambition to create a network of research funding organizations to exchange experiences. We have, uh, regarding this uh, ambition, we have two initiatives. Uh, we have a series of uh, uh, webinars and with the idea of starting an exchange of practices uh, on initiatives taken by uh, RFOs to improve our imp impact on gender uh, equality. So, um, of course, Mithin and RAS, they are two very different RFOs, as one is a national, uh, a, a national uh, a ministry and a national uh, agency for, for funding uh, research. And the other is a regional authority managing also research and innovation funding activities. Uh, within Supra, there is an ambition to network, uh, as I said before, uh, RFOs, as the needs for, uh, of RFOs uh, are totally different uh, to those of the RPOs, as we call the universities we are in this uh, consortium. We want to do this uh, through the organization of webinars uh, as a start. Uh, and in, in the future, we will organize more active experience exchanges among RFOs. Uh, we also developed uh, a living tool, uh, like to collect experiences and resources from uh, and, and for RFOs interested to improve their impact on gender equality. This tool is available uh, via the Supera website, and we will tell uh, you more about this at the end of the of the webinar. So uh, thank you, Paula, to change to, uh, to the, the another slide. The today's uh, today's webinar. We have uh, these um, uh, wonderful um, two experiences um, in this second uh, webinar. And we will have uh, the National Research uh, Agency in France um, to, to, uh, to have their experience and the Technology Agency of the Czech Republic, TACR. Um, this, uh, I mean, both these two experiences, uh, they are both from national RFOs and uh, both of them have been looking at how to avoid gender uh, biases. Uh, the A and uh, R in France at this stage is more in understanding the problem before defining measures. And the uh, Czech uh, agency, the TICR, uh, are already trying uh, measures uh, out. 
So I really have the, the pleasure to, uh, to present uh, today's uh, speakers. And uh, the, the, the first one uh, will be, let me, let me, um, uh, let me just um, say and present uh, both, uh, okay, both, uh, both, uh, uh, both uh, speakers. Uh, both of them are from two sister projects uh, that also have RFOs in their consortiums. Um, the uh, and are in France participates in Gender Smart and TACR in uh, GIC. Okay, uh, so um, let me let me just uh, uh, look uh, for. Um, okay, let me look for these. Uh, um, Sorry for that. Um, okay. Uh, let me, sorry for this. I, I have just, uh, um, um, okay. Let me, let me see. Um, <laughs> sorry for that. Uh, I, 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 um, sorry. Um, do you have, uh, uh, um, sorry, Paula, do you have in front of you the Angela uh, bio, please? Because I, I, I have these problems um, with this. I'm, I'm sorry, I have, I'm having problems with my, with my computer. I don't know what it is uh, happening. Uh, it's in the, in the notes of this, uh, let me see. If you will permit, Maria. If you yes, mind, sorry, uh, I, sorry, I will, yeah, sorry. Um, uh, I will take over to, to present to speak. Yeah, so, sorry. My because... name is Alain Denis. Yes. Uh, nice to see you all and welcome. Okay. So our first speaker is uh, Angela Zeller from ANR. She graduated um, with a degree in educational science and has a master's degree in sociology from um, A H H A S S, uh, Haute Ecole in, in Paris. Um, a school of advanced uh, studies in social science, including uh, she also spent one year of exchange at University of Montreal. Her fields of research are uh, sociology of gender, sociology of work, and sociology of cult culture. She works at the National Research Agency in France since for two years now, and she's acting as project manager for Gender Smart and the activities in the Gender Smart project. Angela, if you can share your screen. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. <laughs> so, hello everyone. I hope everyone is doing well. So, yes, my name is uh, Angela Zeller. I'm a, I'm a project manager uh, of the Gender Smart Project. So, uh, thank you to Alain and Lute for offering me to participate in sharing our experience at the ANR. So, how can RFOs fight gender bias? Next slide, yes. So how can we as a funding agency help reduce inequalities between women and men in higher education and research? In France, higher education and research are still marked by a gender imbalance. The gender structure of our society is expressed at all levels of social organization and the academic system is included. The general observation is that the proportion of women decreases as we rise in the hierarchy of academic positions. And this phenomenon is explained by the persistence of stereotypes, by the invisibilization of women's work, main networks, and by a more complex work-life, private life balance for women. And the evaluation of research and its protagonists can, of course, also be guided by gender stereotypes, which led to biases that, that generate discrimination and inequalities. So thus, as a funding agency, must ensure that calls for proposal are addressed to both women and men, ensuring fair treatment of projects submitted in response to call for projects, ensuring that the evaluation criteria do not disadvantage women, and promoting and giving visibility to work carried out by women. So uh, I'm gonna explain the French legislative context. 
faced with persistent inequalities in higher education and research, the ministry has deployed an action plan based on the interministerial policy for gender equality. The objective is the introduction of a global gender equality policy, taking into account personnel, students, and knowledge. An agreement on professional equality between women and men in the public service was published in 2018. The aim of this agreement is to transform practices in the long term by relying especially on the mandatory and bending introduction of an equality action plan comprising precise and operational action as well as a proactive timetable. So on the slide, I gave you a political reform like uh, the agreement, the law of August 2019, uh, the referential of action plan relating to professional equality between women and men, the decree of March 2020. And so we have the obligation to implement uh, equality action plan in 2020 or face uh, financial uh, penalties. So in this context, to help us continue our action to gain legitimacy on these equality issues, we have signed up uh, the agency in a European project, Gender Smart, made up of nine partners, two technical partners, six research and teaching organizations, and one funding organization. The goal is to develop and implement a gender action plan in each partner organization and disseminate uh, the practices at national and international level that worked for us. So the budget uh, allocated uh, to the owner uh, is uh, 3,100 euros. And the, the project uh, started in January 2019 and will end in 20, 20, December 2022. Next slide. So we started by doing an audit and a self-assessment to from uh, sorry January to July uh, 2019, and it was a lot of work, of course, but collaborative work uh, with social data analysis, uh, with the support of human resources department, analysis of submission and funding data with our impact team, analysis of strategic documents and analysis of communication action with our department, uh, communication department. So what we have observed uh, is that the INR is very well advanced because the agency has since uh, 2017 included its commitment to gender equality as one of the fundamental principles in its action plan and subsequently in its code of ethics and scientific integrity. An equality referent, Laurence Guyard, has also been appointed with the task of setting up an equality action plan within the agency. So in many areas, uh, INR applies the principle of gender equality within its personal its own decision-making bodies and the scientific evaluation committees that INR organizes. But there is uh, no official document that frames, structures, or organizes these approaches and achievements. We need to objectify too, because the data on gender issue remains very patchy. We don't have any data on gender in research projects with gender uh, as an object of research and we don't have any data too on uh, sex and on gender dimension in research projects. So we must therefore go further in a structured way. Next slide. With my colleague, we, be, we have built a literature review on gender biases specific to funding agency. It appears that women are less well rated than men. Unconscious bias is one of the factors and an unconscious bias in the implicit stereotypes that can occur without one knowledge, control or intention. Common biases are gender bias, cultural, age, language and institutional bias. And unconscious bias may occur in every organization, even though organizations are perceived as being sheltered from inequalities 
because they are built on the image of the universal walker and therefore thought as a neutral, but they must be apprehended as social construct that are based on the hierarchical gender difference. The way evaluation panels are constituted may introduce biases in the evaluation of candidates, whether they are men or women. Studies show that women are less valued because they are mostly evaluated by men. However, parity is not sufficient to avoid gender bias in evaluation. Female evaluators can be just as unconsciously biased against female applicants as male evaluators can. Scientific networks, which are mostly male networks, may favor men. A significant body of research illustrates the impact of what is known as implicit bias, which refers to unconsciously held assumptions about specific social groups, for example, gender. And implicit biases can exist even if a person develops a consciously adopted non-biased ideology. So in, in other words, uh, implicit biases can nonetheless remain. But uh, a recent study on the National Committee of the French National Center for Scientific Research, CNRS in France, uh, shows that when the panel members are aware and recognize that biases could occur during the panel, it decreases the gender discrimination in the promotion process. And the last, uh, the last one is indicators of excellence based on year of experience, number of publication and citation, mobility, and size of the candidate's research grant are in favor of men. Because men are consistently perceived as superior, even with an equal resume. Women must have a higher performance to be evaluated equally to men with the lower performance scores. Women are a priori considered as mother and consequently perceived as less, fix less flexible and less available at work because of the motherhood responsibilities. Not taking into account maternity leave uh, impact women advancement or recruitment as they may have interruption in their career and consequently a potential lower scientific production. Women also tend not to be perceived as leaders those who show qualities of leadership may be seen as aggressive when what is valued in women is likability. Fields of research are valued differently because of gender division, and a woman can be less valued in a field mostly invested by men and perceived as a male field. Next slide. So as I said, for the audit, we worked a lot on our data. And the work regarding data collection was made on the generic call for proposal, which represents 80% of the projects funded by the agency. Analyses were conducted about submission and funding data. And regarding the thematic basis, all proposals were taken into account. The generic call for proposal 2018 is organized around 48 research themes. Each re research theme corresponds to a dedicated scientific evaluation panel covering all the involved research themes. So the generic call for proposal I, has four funding instruments. The first one is international collaborative research projects. The second one is collaborative research projects involving enterprises. The third one is collaborative research projects and the last one is the Young Research Instrument. So the project submitted within the framework of the generic call for proposal go through a two-stage selection process. The evaluation is based on fundamental principle, including peer review, equality of treatment, impartiality, and of course, confidentiality. To organize our audit, we played a closer attention to collaborative research projects involving enterprises, collaborative research projects, and young researcher instruments. In the audit framework, we tweaked uh, uh, the data analysis regarding submission and selection of projects. It consisted in cleaning and consolidating our database on several databases. These analyses were extended and consolidated on all the editions from 2015 to 2018. 
So I will present you some results. As you can see on the slide, among the projects submitted to the generic call for proposals from 2015 to 2018, at the end of the process, the percentage of projects conducted by women selected for funding is only 20%. 28%, sorry, whereas at the end of the stage one, the percentage is 30%. So there is a slight difference between uh, re the results, and we can assume the existence of a gender bias in the evaluation. But this therefore requires a further analysis. Next slide. We see uh, that the part of projects led by women corresponds to the part of women among scientists in higher education and research in France. As you can see on the slide, this is the general evolution of submitted projects led by women throughout the different editions of the generic call for proposal. The proportion of projects led by women increases very slowly but constantly. This is the phase one, this is the submission uh, phase. For, for 2015 to 2018. So next slide, uh, this is the results of the selection regarding projects conducted by women and uh, the result is increased constantly. They represent 20% in 2015 and 30% in 2018. So this is uh, the funded uh, projects uh, the funding projects. So, next slide. The analyze based on the funding instrument covering the 2015 to 2018 period of time is very informative and allows to tweak our comprehension on the ongoing process. Indeed, although the proportion of projects conducted by women is steady overall, it varies depending on the funding instrument. While the proportion of projects led by women is globally constant across uh, all editions, it differs significantly from one funding instrument to another. More specifically, more and more women are submitted projects to the Young Research Instrument. It's a G GCGC on the slide. Um, we have not yet consolidated our analysis for 2020, but this trend is confirmed. To be classified as young researchers, applicants must have defending their doctoral thesis less than 10 years ago, but exception may be granted like maternity leave, parental leave, long sick, long-term sick leave, sorry, and national service. The limit is pushed back for a period equal to the duration of this event and to take uh, into account the inequalities due to family responsibilities. Additionally, for women, the limit is extended by one year per dependent child. And we think uh, that women may thus feel more legitimate to submit a project on this instrument, which is smaller in scope first, before uh, attempting a larger instrument. We observed and studies show that women wait until their project is perfect before attempting to something and something bigger. But of course, there are uh, other interpretations. We, we, uh, we can carry out more detailed analysis and especially quali qualitative uh, one. Next slide. So on this slide, this is just a breakdown according to the Europe European Research Council discipline from 2050 to 2018. There is a difference between discipline. Obviously, women are in the majority, uh, the majority in the life science, uh, social and human science and transversal fields. We can see um, there are few women on the graphic with that life science, um, physical science and engineering and uh, social and human sciences. And we, we think it's because in, uh, within the scientific fields, there are research objects more worked by women uh, and by men. So this is an explanation. Also, 
Initial analyses of the selection data are very encouraging in that they show globally fair handling between projects submitted by women and men and those selecting for funding. Of course, more detailed analyses still have to be conducted per scientific field, which show signs of significant disparities in terms of scientific culture and the proportion of women, men among their workforce. Lastly, persuading scientists to mainstream sex and or gender in their research project remains a challenge that the INR will only be able to meet through gradual and court certain implementation of action. Next slide. So based on these results, we built our action plan. We conducted three collaborative workshops with our execu executive committee, the head of impact unit and the prevention assistant. Uh, the action plan is made up of three main areas, uh, culture and organization, human resources and research funding. And for each area, we have identified four or five axes. So this is the structure of our JEP. The first area is, like I said, culture and organization. Established as a fundamental principle in its code of ethics and scientific integrity, gender equality must become a lasting part of the agency's culture. So we have five axes, institutionalize the JEP, incorporate equality in values, objectify possible equalities, communicate and train and raise awareness. The second area is human resources, uh, because even though uh, women account for about 60% of the total INA workforce, this numerical overrepresentation does, does not protect from inequalities. So the agency must have a clear human resources policy for equality covering the recruitment process, the remuneration, the career management, the professional life and private life balance, and sexual harassment and sexism at work. The last area is funding research. Funding and promoting the development of basic and target research is the first agency mission. For its implementation, the agency organizes evaluation committees based on the principle of peer evaluation operating competitive selection. Despite the INR recommendation since its inception to look for parity in scientific evaluation committees, women make up 20 to 30% of committee members with significant differences between fields of research. This underrepresentation of women reflect the gender imbalance among researchers in scientific communities. Similarly, like I said, the proportion of projects submitted by women account for about 30% of all projects submitted, all filled together. Next slide. So uh, our fir first act in the third area is a call for proposal. Like I said, this is the biggest call of the agency. And calls for proposal must be drafted in line with the objective and therefore meet an equality drafting requirement by targeting both women and men and incorporating the sex and or gender dimension in the description of scientific areas covered by the call. So, uh, oh. this is better. So, you have action, uh, for example, world, the first action is world the call for proposal in compliance with the drafting rules set out in the specific guide. Then you have a colon uh, with entity and person in charge. Then you have indicators or deliverables and then the timetable. So the second act is incorporate the sex and gender dimension in research projects. Uh, numerous studies over the last 30 years show that gender stereotypes impact scientific approaches, even in the most objective sciences and introduce gender biases in the production of knowledge, even though recommendation to take the gender and or sex dimension into account in research have multiplied since the 60s making research project funding conditional on the quality 
with will these dimensions taken into account in the project following the example of the Canadian Institute of Health Research or the Irish Re Research Council can be a major lever. So for example, we have action on raise the awareness of, of scientific communities, um, and the last uh, action in 2022 is to introduce an evaluation criteria on whether or not the sex and or gender dimension is taken into account in research projects submitted to the generic call for proposal. Next slide. Uh, evaluation acts. Like I said, evaluating research and its protagonists can also be guided by gender stereotypes leading to biases that generate discrimination and inequality. Like I said before, parity is important, but not achievable in many areas because of the gender disparities between women and men in scientific fields. And parity is not a sufficient condition for reducing uh, gender bias. So on the slide, for example, the first action is strive for parity when constituting evaluation committee by mobilizing networks or databases such as AcademiaNet. Uh, the agency is a partner of AcademiaNet. And uh, as you can see, the last action is test uh, anonymization. We, we want to test anonymization, but it will be on small calls for projects uh, as some funding agency have already tasted in Switzerland, I think, and Ireland, for example. The last uh, axe is impact. In the context of the mission set out by the 2006 decree, the agency undertakes to analyze the evolution of research provision and measure the impact of the funding it allocates. In conjunction with research stakeholders in France and abroad, the agency takes part in ongoing thinking about impact evaluation and conducts studies on various project portfolio at several analysis levels. Reviewing the impact of public policy and scientific policy is a need expressed by political decision makers in order to account to the public for the results of the spending invested. Going beyond the standard evaluation of scientific production, this involves describing and measuring the benefits of research for society. The underlying impact issues are therefore very diverse and each one should be listed from a gender perspective. In a view of the obstacles encountered in women's career progression, it's important to be able to identify the impact of the funding of their pro project-based research on their professional career path and their scientific production in a comparative way. So as you can see on the slide, we want to develop indicators to measure the scientific production of women and men. We want to develop indicators to identify who are the spokesperson for the results of research project and develop indicators to collect gender disaggregated data on the status of project leaders and scientists involved in the project. So our action plan was validated by our executive committee in December 2019, by our staff representatives in March, and by our board of directors in uh, July 2020. It was then presented to all agents in July, and it is on our site in French for now, for now but the English version is coming. This is the members of our core group, Loïc Dubois, Prevention Assistant, E4, Head of Scientific Operation Department, Laurence Guillard, the INR representative in the steering committee, Gender Smart, and she is gender equality referent, Caroline Lefeu, quality referent and staff representative, Corinne Le Nigigon, Head of Communication Department, Emmanuel Simon, the INR representative of the middle management for Gender Smart. Philippe Terral, the Director of Human Resources Department, Berenger Virlon, Head of Unit Studies, Data and Impact Assessment, and myself. So to conclude, we have started to put action in place, particularly around the communication of the action plan and few internal action. But with the COVID situation, we are a bit slower like everyone else. 
for phase two of the generic call for proposal, we asked the project leaders to say whether or not they took into account the sex and or gender dimension in their project. This response paragraph was not submitted to the reviewers for now. And we have analyzed the responses with my colleague Laurence, and we are in the process of writing uh, the report. This is a very big job because there are over 3,000 pages of responses to analyze, and we are doing it together, so it, it takes uh, a long time. And in December, we are also organizing a conference on gender in research with our French partner, coordinator of the project, the CIRAD. The conference focuses on gender in research, evaluation, and knowledge production. It, it will be virtual, of course, because of the COVID. And all intervention will be filmed, recorded, and available on our YouTube channel. You are, of course, fully welcome to assist, but uh, it's going to be in French. So that's it for me. Uh, thank you. And uh, thank you very much. And that's okay. it. <laughs> thank you so much, uh, Angela. Thank you for your excellent presentation. Uh, now we will uh, we will pass directly to the to the second uh, presentation by Jana Dovarovka from the GICO project and the Technology Agency of the Czech Republic. Uh, Jana is a sociologist. She specializes in gender equality issues in research and higher education and working environment in academia. She is a gender expert in the Technology Agency of the Czech Republic, that is a national level research funding organization where she is responsible for the implementation of the Structural Change Project GECO. She's, she's also an assistant professor of the Gender Studies programs at Charles University and a postdoctoral researcher at the Center for Gender and Science at the Institute of Sociology of the Czech Academy of Sciences. Jana, thank you so much and, and, and please. Uh, the floor is yours. Uh, please, as, as Lydia has said in the chat, uh, please uh, do all your questions uh, through the chat and then we will uh, have this uh, debate after that. So thank you, Jana, whenever you want. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, the Super Art team, for inviting me to this webinar and uh, thank you also for the introduction. I will share my screen now. Yes. Can you see it, please? Yes? Yes, we can. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Perfect. So uh, as you already know, I work as a gender expert in the technology agency of the Czech Republic. And because I will be speaking about our approach uh, and our future steps, uh, I would like to provide you first with some background information on this organization. And the technology agency was founded in 2009, and it is a national level RFO supporting uh, applied research and innovation. Uh, we do not focus on technologies only, but on all possible fields of research and innovation, including social sciences and humanities. Uh, currently, we have around uh, 160 employees and um, our agency became active in gender equality agenda some uh, six years ago. Uh, however, our activities uh, in this area have become complex uh, only with our involvement in the project uh, GECO, which is an acronym for gender equality in engineering through communication and commitment. Uh, this is a structural change project bringing together for uh, RPOs uh, from the STEM field, implementing CHEPs, and two RFOs. Mm. Uh, there are also other partners uh, providing uh, expertise and technical assistance. Mm. Under this project, uh, Technology Agency leads uh, the work package implementing gender equality in uh, RFOs. Uh, we are not implementing JEP. Egypt, uh, strictly speaking, but uh, we are introducing uh, various measures to improve gender equality among uh, researchers uh, and to increase gender sensitivity in research. And it was uh, 
thanks to this project that we've got to the topic of uh, gender and other biases in the process of uh, evaluation of research proposals. So, just to say a few words uh, on the current state of play. Well, I would say that we are still mm, more or less at the beginning because, or to put it differently, we have studied the phenomenon and possible approaches to uh, its elimination used by different organizations, but we have not transformed our own organizational practices yet. So uh, as part of uh, the JACO project, we developed a guideline for promoting gender equality in the evaluation process. And this guideline is for general use, not uh, tailored to our specific needs yet. Uh, it is in English and you can download it on our website or through this uh, link that you can see uh, on the slide. Um, the concept of this uh, document as such is uh, a bit broader because it focuses on various actions that may strengthen uh, gender balance among peer reviewers and members of uh, evaluation panels, uh, the importance of accounting for uh, career breaks and on possible revisions of common performance indicators as they may be gendered to some extent uh, too. Uh, each part of the, this guideline is preceded by a short introduction to the existing uh, research evidence and data and policies and examples uh, already practiced by uh, some uh, uh, or by selected funding organizations. So it can be said that we, we have done uh, a theoretical preparation and precise the concept uh, of our future approach. Uh, and uh, this approach has already been discussed uh, with our management and approved. Uh, and our aim is to put it in uh, practice uh, in the future months. Mm. So now I would like to mention in brief some concrete strategies and techniques described uh, in the guideline that can help RFOs and individual uh, evaluators to support just evaluation. First, I will describe uh, possible steps at the organizational level, and then I will present in brief uh, recommendations and techniques uh, for individual reviewers and uh, evaluation panel members. Just to move to the next slide. So, how can funders help to eliminate gender and other biases? The first uh, recommendation would be to integrate uh, this commitment to eliminate the influence of bias in evaluation into institutional policy. Uh, this can also motivate applicants from marginalized groups to submit projects uh, with your organization. Uh, then what is also important is a gender sensitive formulation of the evaluation criteria. Um, because um, they should be formulated uh, in a way that does not uh, implicitly connect the idea of the right candidate with qualities stereotypically, stereotypically attributed to men. So um, some expressions like uh, uh, should be avoided like competitive or an emphasis on scientists uh, willing to engage in risk taking or achieve technological breakthrough because this can be seen as uh, bias enhancing conditions and a similar effect uh, may have also an emphasis on excellence as has been observed by some. Uh, next uh, useful practice is of course awareness raising uh, for evaluators and chairs of evaluation committees. Uh, so this should be, uh, or the commitment uh, uh, should be uh, included in the instructions for evaluators with guidelines, with concrete guidelines, how to eliminate one's own bias for evaluators. Uh, RFO should provide trainings for peer reviewers and panel members. And uh, of course, many RFOs uh, do this already, but uh, besides face-to-face -face trainings, uh, 
which may be a bit uh, complicated uh, or not feasible at all, it is possible to use some videos that have uh, already uh, been created by some organizations. And in my view, the best uh, video probably is, uh, is a video created by uh, Instituto Cerca in 2016. It is called uh, Recruitment Bias in Research Institute and Institutes. And I think that this was uh, created as part of the Libra project, but not, not, I'm not completely sure. But, and uh, this video is also used by the uh, European Research Council. Mm. Also, or um, I, I believe that it is uh, important to offer face-to-face -face trainings, especially to chairs, because of their uh, important role in uh, the evaluation process. And uh, another recommendation would be uh, do, uh, would be uh, do some short briefings before each evaluations panels proceedings. So it may uh, even <laughs> let's say uh, activate some mutual surveillance. So <laughs> um, another recommendation, but this is something uh, that can help uh, uh, in a more indirect way is a predetermined seating uh, arrangement and panel proceedings. This is something um, done by the Swedish Research Council. Um, what is uh, of key importance is that uh, uh, the evaluation criteria are formulated in a clear way and they are, and they are applied consistently. Uh, so it means that uh, it should be made clear what is considered as fulfillment of each criterion and how it is going to be measured. For example, what is understood uh, as uh, research excellence or applicants independence. And it should be also clarified which uh, criteria have uh, priority. Mm. The, evalu the evaluators should be also instructed to avoid vague formulations, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It should be also unsure that evaluators uh, assess an application as a whole, and their evaluation is not influenced by one or few selected aspects. Mm. What I find also to be very important is uh, to have preset rules for project presentation and discussion. Uh, so that means that the rules should be formalized, the rules for project presentation, I mean, uh, and uh, there should be some clear presentation structure and it should be clear what type uh, of uh, information is supposed to be presented. Next slide. Um, what is also crucial is to have enough time for every project. Uh, I am aware of the fact that it is not sometimes uh, easy, but uh, research has shown that uh, time pressure is an important factor uh, in which bias can occur and can inf have influence on decision making. So we should try to uh, plan the proceedings so that there is enough time. Um, Another recommendation also quite difficult is to create an atmosphere in which perceived uh, biases can be discussed. Uh, what is uh, also done by some agencies and especially by the Swedish Research uh, Council is uh, uh, inviting uh, gender expert or gender observer to panel meetings. Uh, another interesting uh, practice, but not uh, not so easily um, or not so feasible, is uh, blinding of applications or using lottery practices in selecting projects uh, for uh, support. Um, this has uh, clear effects, but it is uh, a complicated practice. Yeah, so. It's, it's not, uh, it cannot be applied. 
very easily. Uh, and the, the last recommendation, and this one is of course crucial, is uh, to monitor uh, success rate and to publish the results uh, on, a, on a regular basis and to discuss it with the organization management, have it on uh, one's website, etc., etc. And uh, now I would like to move to recommendations uh, for individual evaluators, how they can try to eliminate bias. Um, of course, uh, the individual uh, evaluators uh, uh, are decisive part of the, of the process. And uh, um, this is something that what we, what we will also do, that we will we will offer this set of recommendations for individual evaluators uh, and it, it will become a part of written instructions. So the first recommendation is to uh, accept that, accept the very fact that uh, um, our evaluation is not less influenced by stereotypes and biases than the evaluation of others, because as we all know, bias is not something dependent on intelligence or education, but uh, research has shown those who believe that their personal objectivity, uh, that they are objective, uh, give more biased uh, evaluation. So, mm, the willingness to accept one's uh, own error is an important step to just evaluation. Mm. Another recommendation is try to keep in mind how bias works and consciously lower the impact of stereotypes on uh, one's evaluation. Uh, I am aware of the fact that this recommendation may sound a bit uh, empty or flat, so that is why I would really recommend to use uh, the video that I have already mentioned because it shows in a very nice way uh, some problematic aspects uh, of uh, the evaluation process and recommendation how to act in similar situations. Uh, it's, it is also good that this video is quite short, so it has around seven minutes, so uh, it shouldn't be a barrier. Again, uh, what is crucial is to reserve enough time for uh, evaluation because uh, research has proved that uh, time pressure and multitasking increase uh, the influence of cognitive bias on decision making. Um, another recommendation is to use the same criteria for all applicants, that is clear. <laughs> um, because for example, again, uh, co-authoring publications sometimes uh, gives rise to doubting women's thought independence, but uh, the same is not true with men. Next recommendation is to be prepared to defend uh, the reasons of or for one's evaluation and also to maybe to think about the criteria for assessing uh, scientific excellence because uh, one has to ask oneself a question whether both men and women have the same uh, opportunity to fulfill some criteria. Uh, or uh, whether all possible research outputs are considered because uh, it is known from research that women and men have may have slightly different uh, output patterns. It is also very much dependent on the scientific fields. Uh, also, another recommendation is to evaluate an application as a whole, so not base one's evaluation on single aspect or several aspects, the, then to examinate our, uh, examinate our own judgment in evaluation and to notice uh, possible bias in uh, others because it, is, it may be a, an important learning uh, experience. So, so that would be to our guideline and now I, I will just summarize what uh, we will do in the future months, because uh, what we would like uh, to start with is to integrate the 
anti-bias policy in relevant materials uh, related to the process of evaluation to put a chapter on gender bias in each course guideline for evaluators and uh, integrate the topic in seminars for evaluators and in briefings for chairpersons, at least. Mm. This general conception of our future steps has already been approved uh, by our management, as I have already said, but, and it was interesting because there were no objections, uh, which is probably also due to the fact that they are well aware that these practices are not uncommon in uh, other European organizations. Uh, and they also, of course, want us to uh, implement our project. So <laughs> uh, that was quite easy, easier than I had expected. But uh, where I expect some resistances uh, is um, on the part of our co-workers who work with uh, evaluators and who administer the individual calls because they may uh, face uh, themselves some resistances from the evaluators. Uh, so it is possible that there will, that uh, due to their resistances, there will be a need for further re renegotiation with the management because the two different positions will uh, have to be reconciled somehow. We will have to reach a compromise, but let, we will see. Um, and what I would also like to say is that um, the technology agency is probably not an organization where the impact of implicit bias would be uh, particularly strong. Uh, because we do not provide uh, any individual grants, only uh, research, uh, only grants for research teams, uh, and these are usually mixed in terms of their gender composition. Um, but uh, what is interesting, we have a very similar result as uh, ANR, because uh, we we have set up a new monitoring system uh, just recently, but what we know is that uh, uh, in, in the last year, um, the difference uh, between success rates of men and uh, women as principals, principal investigators was around 2%. So maybe it is because of bias. We don't know yet. We will have to monitor it in a long-term um, time period. Mm -hmm. Uh, also, we do not uh, focus uh, so much on uh, research excellence in terms of prestigious publications, etc. But we uh, we focus more on the project uh, itself and its uh, possible uh, application or the possible application of its uh, results in um, practice. So. I'm, I'm not sure how uh much uh, strong uh, factor the biases are but it is something that we will see but still uh still i find it uh, very important to introduce these measures because this is this is also because of the fact that uh, other funders or other organizations in our country do not engage in these activities uh, yet. So any change in the minds of our evaluators can possibly affect their uh, work for other funders as well as their practices at their um, home institutions like higher education institutions, research institutes where they are employed. So this uh, small or these efforts may hopefully stimulate uh, some changes in the research ecosystem as such, however small they would be, and uh, this may influence women's position in research and higher education in an indirect way, I believe. So this brings me to the end of my presentation and thank you for your attention. Okay. Thank you so much, Jana, for your excellent uh, presentation. And now, uh, Lydia Gonzalez from Nissin will take over uh, the debate. Uh, Lydia, please. Yes, uh, good morning, everyone. So I'll try to collect um, your questions and give the floor to those of you who want to ask 
directly or maybe make comments or share your experiences with this uh, topic. And at the end, um, someone from Yellow Window uh, would like to share some information regarding one of the tools we are developing in Supra, uh, right? But first, let's go to the, the questions. We had some from um, Nadesh Rico. Could you please, uh, for Angela, uh, could you please share the reference on the Senegal study you, you just mentioned, please? And also for Angela, maybe I, I'll uh, tell you the both. Uh, could you share the absolute numbers of the results presented regarding gender bias in the selection project? projects, how many applications were there in 2018 overall? And I guess that Victoria Lay asked that, right? So Angela, if you want to ask to answer. Yes, uh, I already put the CNRS reference on the chat box. It's uh, the title is a committee with implicit biases promote fewer women when they do not believe in gender biases exist. I put already the link for our conference in December and about the numbers. So among the, uh, I, yeah, I'm sorry for the PPT because I don't share in full screen. So you maybe you have problem to see the exact uh, uh, percentage, but among the projects submitted to the generic call for proposal, only 30% were conducted by women and 69 conducted by men. Uh, but I don't have, uh, I'm sorry, the absolute number because uh, I don't understand, I can't connect to the databases. It's uh, our unit impact, uh, impact team unit uh, who produce the data, so I'm not... Uh, the specialist uh, for the data, but for all edition from 2015 to 2018, at the end of the process of so for the funded uh, projects, the percentage of projects conducted by women selected for funding is only 28 percent, and uh, for projects conducted by men, it's 71 percent. But uh, all our analyses are available on our website. I can put the link uh, on the chat box if you want. Uh, so yeah, that, that's it for the question, I, I think. Okay. okay. Thank, thank you so much. And there was also a question for Hannah. Um, what is predetermined seating arrangements at panels proceedings? Could you, be, could you please explain a bit? Uh, this is something uh, that's uh, being done by the Swedish Research Council and uh, this is really in relation to the elimination of gender bias, a uh, rather uh, indirect tool, but uh, in fact it, it means that uh, you think in advance before the proceedings uh, where different people how to distribute people in the room because of course there are some uh, people who have higher power because they are for more prestigious uh, institutions or they may be friends and or they may uh, have and have other characteristic and uh, it uh, it is known that uh, it's uh, quite important who sits next to whom who is uh, uh, the closest uh, to the chairman or to the chair of the commission. So uh, this this means to think about these dynamics and uh, in relation to gender bias, uh, it is uh, uh, seen as uh, a factor that may contribute uh, to, um, to um, uh, not obje greater objectivity, but uh, at least to the fact that uh, more voices can be heard and this, that uh, the distribution of uh, uh, the speakers is uh, more balanced. Yes, so hopefully okay. <laughs> I explained it. <laughs> 
Um, there is also a, a question for you, Hannah. Uh, you mentioned the face-to-face -face training for panel members. Can you say a little bit more about the content and methodology of such training? Is the impact of the training monitor at your organization? If so, how? Well, we have not started with this yet, so this is just our plan to start with that. So, but uh, what I would do, how I would uh, conceptualize it, if I can just imagine uh, now, is uh, that I would for I would probably use the video and then discuss it with the help of some research findings because they are also summarized in the guideline uh, I, I, am, I am sharing uh, with you or the link I was sharing with you. Uh, and I believe that uh, for this group of people, the evaluators who are usually scientists themselves, uh, it makes sense to combine some personal experience uh, and uh, the video together with research findings. But this is just a preliminary concept I have in my mind. <laughs> I will have to think about it more. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Um, there is a, now a question for Angela. Uh, for evaluators in panels, it's very hard. Recognize they evaluate not free of stereotypes. And this creates a defensive attitude and resistances. How to deal with this negative predisposition? So for the evaluators, uh, the aid of uh, panel uh, committee panel, we do trainings and in the trainings, uh, my colleague Laurence Guillard, uh, the equality referent, uh, talks about biases, talks about uh, stereotypes and uh, our implication for reducing inequalities. Uh, the agency signed the DORA chart. So uh, for example, evaluators do not have to take into account, for example, H index. So uh, they know the, the implication uh, uh, of the agency. And um, Laurence uh, do an INR tour. She, she traveled uh, in all the university to, to provide uh, formation about uh, the funding instrument, etc. Cetera, et cetera. And she, she also talks about uh, gender stereotypes, gender bias. And she said uh, it, it's generally, generally well received, but uh, our role, I think, at the agency is to reduce possible uh, biases, but, but accept the training, uh, the training, the awareness on this subject, the parity in committees, but not the parity like, like I explained before. We just can reduce possible biases, but I think unconscious biases are very strong. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Uh, we have another question for Hannah, but maybe for both of you. Uh, do you believe that combating stereotypes and bias in scientific evaluation is complicated by the overall adverse context for gender knowledge in Central and Eastern Europe and or by the strong belief in the neutrality objectivity of science that may persist in this region? Well, if I can say something, uh, yes, of course, I think that uh, it's harder for us because uh, of these resistances towards uh, gender equality, even though I don't think uh, that the Czech Republic belongs to the worst cases, but yeah, I don't want to generalize um, th these situations, uh, but um, well, it is difficult for me because I cannot compare it with uh, people from other countries, from more Western countries. I don't have any ex ex personal experience uh, with explaining this phenomena to them. But yeah, I do believe that it is a complicating factor. Okay, thank you so much. Um, both of you have uh, mentioned um, your reflections on the selection of criteria, the definition of criteria um, from a gender perspective. 
Uh, could you please um, elaborate a bit more or explain how you addressed, um, for instance, uh, the concept of excellence from a gender perspective, uh, just in case you have done this in your organizations, or maybe um, is there any uh, criticism in your organizations um, regarding impact factors at earlier stages of their research career? I don't know who wants to. Okay. I may start. Yeah, if it is okay. Uh, well, I think that the first thing is not to use this term, <laughs> if possible. And uh, as far as our organization is uh, concerned, as I have already said, it is uh, we do not uh, focus so much on this uh, traditional notion of uh, research excellence because, uh, for example, in terms of uh, publications and CVs, uh, our rule is that uh, uh, the five most important research outputs should be listed, not uh, uh, necessarily all publications one have, but th just those that are more relevant for the content of the project. And this may be one practice, but uh, I would not say that this was motivated at the very beginning um, by the efforts to avoid these problems connected with the, with the um, excellence uh, problem. <laughs> but motivations were different, but uh, in fact, I believe that it works uh, and it may improve uh, our practices. And yes, I, I will finish it here. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. And from our side, uh, at the agency, we did a resume uh, review. When the coordinators uh, submit their project, uh, they, they have to mention only five major uh, publications link uh, to, to the project or the, the publication uh, that can help to, to, to have, uh, to, to have the, the, the funded, sorry. And uh, like I mentioned before, the DORA, the DORA chart, uh, they, they, they sign uh, the code of ethics, uh, the deontology charter at these agencies, so they, they know about uh, our uh, engagement about uh, the H index. And um, I think uh, this is it. And uh, I want to, to mention uh, in the eval uh, assessment process, um, the coordinator uh, receive the evaluation and they have the right to, to make a comment on the evaluation. And the, the, the evaluator responds, et cetera, et cetera. They have the right to respond to the evaluation. So yes, I hope I, I answer to the question. Okay, thank okay. you. Of course. And there is, um, <clears throat> sorry, a, another question for both of you. Research funding agencies are often relatively recent or recently reshaped organizations in the research ecosystem. Is it an asset for mainstreaming gender in science if compared to longer established uh, universities or research performing organizations? Well, if I may, may uh... I do believe that this is true, uh, especially for our agency, um, because um, here it is also combined uh, with the fact that uh, we are focused a bit on innovations and on experimental research, and it somehow <laughs> enables us to uh, experiment more with our approaches as well. <laughs> hmm? Yes. Uh, uh, That's I not ethos, yes. yes. <laughs> okay, so if there are no more questions or, or comments you, you want to add at this point, 
I don't see any more in the in the chat. So I guess that um, maybe we can close the webinar at this at this point. <coughs> sorry, sorry, yeah, there, there is someone. Post. Yeah, there is someone wanted, want, wanting to yes. do something. So yeah, please, if you want to unmute yourself. Hello to everyone. Um, thank you for these uh, interesting presentations. Uh, I tried to formulate my question. Uh, it was meant to uh, Angela because uh, she uh, mentioned uh, um, something about the funding uh, calls and uh, what the applicants uh, need to incorporate uh, in their uh, applications. Uh, you mentioned that the, the main applicant needs to uh, explain how they take into consideration these uh, uh, gender biases in their research or something. I'm sorry, I, I might have yeah. uh, understood it uh, incorrectly, but uh, could you elaborate uh, more on that topic? Because in Estonia, uh, we, uh, uh, we do have this criticism that uh, we don't want to add anything more into the applications and we don't want to add any uh, additional bureaucracy uh, to to the applications so so um, have you had any experience with that already or 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 what is uh, what are your thoughts uh, about this uh, this question um, it it was just a, a test a test phase in uh, July for the second stage of the process and uh, we we writing the report uh, with my with my colleague, but I can say for now uh, it's just a, a little uh, paragraph uh, they have to 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 answer, and in majority they answer to this paragraph. I don't have the results yet. We 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 work on it, but it was just a taste phase. But we want to include at the at the end uh, of the JEP in 2022 the evaluation criteria uh, in the, the call for proposal for now uh, I, can, I can say much it's a, it's a, it's a taste but I understand uh, your your point about uh, the administrative work uh, I understand what you say, but uh, I, I don't have the final result yet, but I, I share with you the, the result. <laughs> Thank you. So if there are no more questions, I guess that we can uh, close the, the webinar um, here. Uh, let me just a friendly reminder of a couple of things regarding the Supra project. Um, Paula has uh, left in the, in the chat um, the link of a, uh, for a Supra tool about RFO's JEP actions uh, that can be found in our website. Um, please consider also that you will receive a questionnaire, an evaluation questionnaire at the end of the session. And you have also the, the link to our newsletter if you want to receive um, updated uh, news. Thank you so much once again to, to our speakers and to all the participants for, for attending the this second webinar. Once we have more information on the next one, um, we will publish it in the website. And of course, you will receive um, the details as uh, registered participants. So, and we hope that it will be, of course, of your interest and useful for your organizations. I don't know if you, Maria, you want to say goodbye as coordinator, maybe? Yeah, yes, yes, say goodbye. And of course, thank you very much to all the people uh, who uh, have showed up and especially to our two wonderful speakers, uh, Angela and, and Jana, thank you so much. And hope to see you in the next one, okay? We will keep you posted about the, the next uh, webinar of this series. So thank you so much for your time and your, uh, and your interest in this. Thank you. Thank you, bye.